Well, let's, let's do a search in the scripture to find um, prophecy in operation in the Old Testament, in the life of Jesus, and in the New Testament. And um, one of my favorite places that, that I like to go uh, to see how this gift should operate is in the ministry of Haggai and Zechariah. And you can read about them in their, in their, they both have books, you can read their books of, of the prophecies that they're giving. Uh, but Ezra talks about them. And if you can imagine, this is in Ezra chapter five uh, and six. If you can imagine, um, the, the Jewish people returned from Babylon, they go back home, uh, everything's in ruins, they go back to Jerusalem, the temple's in ruins, the city's in ruins, the walls are all down. And, and they start to build, they lay out the foundation of, of the temple and anyone who saw the temple of Solomon wept. Anyone who saw, never saw that or, or you know, were just rejoicing that this new day had come, they're rejoicing. And, and both, both voices were being raised at the same time and it was a really challenging time. Then there's enemies that, that the, the enemy rose up against them and, and legally tried to stop them, writing letters to the king saying these people are rebellious. Uh, there's people who are trying to infiltrate uh, the whole project so they can dismantle it from within. So there's enemies. And what God does to resolve all of that, the discouragement, the, the I mean, there's not enough money to do this. There's not enough manpower. Uh, extremely hard work. They were discouraged. And what he did is he sent two prophets. And these two prophets began to prophesy. And as they prophesied, they prospered and the work went forward. And all the obstacles, including the letters that they thought were going to stop the work, when the king read the letters and went to the archives and got all the, the original letters that the previous king had said, you know, he released even more money and even told the enemies that they were the ones who were supposed to supply the money, the oil, the goats, the, the rams, the bulls, anything that they needed. I mean, it just totally backfired on them. But it was through the prophesying of these two men that the work really went forward. There's times in my life as a pastor that, I, that I've asked the Lord to send prophets into our church. And, and I begin looking to see who's out there that I'm limited. I'm limited as a pastor of how far I can take my church. I'm limited from within just because I see what everyone, you know, I see us. My, my own vision is limited. To have prophets come in who don't know us and we don't really know them and they begin to prophesy, man, can it ever take your church to another level? With it comes risk, but the risk, every time I've done that have been, have far outweighed, uh, uh, the benefits have far outweighed the risks. And so I, I, I thank God for uh, teams of prophets who've come to our church in the past and, and have just changed the whole game for us. And so then we see a guy named Micaiah in 1 Kings chapter, two, or chapter 22. And <clears throat> uh, I like this guy. I feel sorry for him in, in, in a respect. Um, there's Ahab and Jehoshaphat. They're, you know, opposing kings and they come together and they agree to work together. They're going to go off to war together. They're sitting on their thrones with their robes. And uh, one of them leans over and says, you know, do we have any prophets to tell us whether this is the will of God, to tell us how the battle is going to turn out? And so Ahab brings out all his prophets, including a false prophet who gets all these, he makes these steel horns and he said this is how the kings are gonna gore the enemies and you know he it's really dramatic it looks really super impressive except the guy's faults mm -hmm. and all these other prophets got in line and they said yeah you're gonna win you're gonna prosper it's gonna be it's gonna be just fine and so after all of this who knows how many have gone in front of him and prophesied all this stuff Jehoshaphat's still not satisfied he says he leans over, he says, isn't there, a word, isn't there a prophet from the Lord? He says, there's one, this Micaiah. He's always, he never prophesies anything good about me. He never says anything nice. Everything he says is, is, is corrective and, and he's not happy with him. And, and Jehoshaphat says, don't say that. Let's, let's bring him out. 
And so in the meantime, a messenger went to get Micaiah. As they're walking, he said, here's what all the other prophets have said, and you better get in line. You better prophesy the same stuff. <laughs> you know, you're in trouble. Here's what they said. Say something nice, okay? Say, can you just go along with this? And he says, I'll say whatever the Lord gives me to say, and nothing more, nothing less. I'll, you know, he's a man of integrity. He gets before the king, and this is a funny little thing. He actually does say what all the others have said. And the king says, I knew, I knew you would do this. Tell me the real word of the Lord. And he said, well, I'll tell you what happened. I saw, and so it tells me that maybe he saw through the discerning of spirits. He said, I saw a vision of, of evil spirits coming before God, talking about this battle. And, and one of them said, and one of, different ones would say, here's how we'll take down Ahab. And then one of them came and said, I know how to take them down. And he said, what would you do? And he says, I would become a lion spirit in the mouths of their prophets. Can you imagine the prophets all hearing this? I'll become a lion spirit, which is a real amazing insight. It's not like demons only have certain specific uh, sins that they're responsible for. They could morph into, they could do lots of different things. And so he said, I'll become a lion spirit in the mouth. And he said, you know, this will work. Go for it. You're allowed to do it. And so <laughs> this is a major discerning of spirits that's operating. And uh, so the false prophet punches him in the mouth, hits him across the side of the head. And, and um, then Micaiah says, uh, you know, they, they sentenced him to jail. He actually was sentenced to bread and water, thrown in jail and said, don't release this guy until I come home. And he says, if you ever come home, I, God never spoke through me. And that's the last we hear of him. We don't know what happens to him. But the character, the quality of his prophecy, the level of his prophecy, and of course it happened exactly as he said. It came to pass exactly as he said. The whole thing of standing alone, the whole thing of standing against the crowd, standing against popular opinion, standing against the king, no fear of man. I mean, it's just easily one of my favorite prophets in the Old Testament just because he was just such a remarkable man. Um, another one's found in Second Chronicles, chapter 20. <clears throat> and I love this prophet as well. For a long time I thought maybe he was un, unnamed, but his name is Jehaziel. Jehaziel, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. And this is a, a critical time in Israel's history. They're surrounded by the enemy, and they don't know what to do. Jehoshaphat's a king, and he, he looks to the Lord and uh, prays a, a profound prayer. This is 2 Chronicles 20, beginning in verse 14. And um, he lays out this amazing prayer, and in, as in response to the prayer, I mean, he's praying the will of God. He's praying the word of God. You can see it all the way down. And verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and uh, he was a Levite, one of, the, one of the worshipers, one of the sons of Asaph. And he raised his voice in the midst of the assembly. And I can just picture, you know, there's a heavy pall. There's this a depression over the assembly. They're all gathered together. The king gets out in front of everyone and lays out this wonderful, godly prayer that, that is really worth studying in itself. And all of a sudden, some young guy tips his head back and out of his throat comes this word that stops time, a word that just cuts through the depression. And he says, um, listen, all of you of Judea, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, 
Thus says the Lord to you. Wow, that must have just cut the air. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. So he's given them a very specific direction. And this is what I was saying yesterday, that oftentimes uh, prophecy is the flatbed or the train car, and on top, of, on top of it you can set revelation gifts. That's what's happening here. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Je uh, Jeruel. And you'll not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judea, Judea, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Wow. So he bows his head. I mean, they all just could put their face right to the ground, forehead right to the ground. Can you imagine hearing from God in that pressure cooker, in that context? This is, this is where prophecy, when you, when you don't know what to do, you, 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 you're just stuck in this awful, awful dilemma. One person raises their voice and it changes the day. It changes the whole thing. They just bowed their heads. They just got before the Lord. And of course, the next day, uh, they, go, they go out and, and the leader, Jehoshaphat, he says uh, in verse 20, Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And so that, that's the beauty of, of prophecy. It can just change everything. I've seen this um, one time when I was in Bible school we were free to prophesy um, during our worship times and in our chapel times that we had every day. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord moved in me to prophesy and I just let it rip. And you could really feel it just change something in the environment. Uh, the teacher who was teaching that morning got on his face before the Lord, got behind his desk and he just hit the ground. Well, I didn't know it, but he was going through a major battle that day. It had been building, but that day was just like the crescendo, the most difficult time for him. He was battling a depression. That word changed the moment for him, and he began to teach like another man. It just took the class to an entirely different level. And it was an example for me of how just one prophecy can change something for the whole group and benefit the whole group and uh, something you never forget. In 2 Peter, he talks about Old Testament prophets. And so let's go to 2 Peter, chapter 1. In verse 20 he says, knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So it's talking about the people who were inspired to write scripture. So and that's the Old Testament. But the, here's an insight, verse 21. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We did a study not too long ago last week about being filled with the Spirit. So now they're being moved by the Spirit. So it wasn't something they, they had um, uh, free choice in. There, there's a partnership, and th this is what's hard to grasp for, for people. It's not all of God and none of us. It's not all of man and none of God. There's this tremendous partnership where they were sensing a stirring or uh, what we called filling of the Spirit and they got in sync with that and they spoke. So God prompts them, God, something starts bubbling up and then they spoke. So it wasn't like they, they could just prophesy. I've heard people say, yeah, I can just prophesy anytime I want to. I think you can do that, but I doubt that it's the Lord. I think it's just you imitating the cadence, the sound, the, the rhythm, the, the kind of language that we use when we prophesy. Uh, anybody can mimic that, can imitate that, but it's not something you can just do by choice. 
However, when you, when you have a gift of prophecy, um, this is where it gets a little different. When there's a gift of prophecy, you can put yourself in a position where you're going to pray over, over people. And because you're in that position and because you're, you're wanting to extend grace to those people, the Holy Spirit does bubble up and you speak. And there's a part of it where you're actually putting yourself in a position where that can happen. There's been different times where, where I, I felt like in prayer before the meeting, the Lord wanted me to call people out, have them stand up, and the prophecy was going to happen. Well, I didn't have any prophecy. I didn't have anything for anybody. And so I would scan the audience looking for who I should pick. And somebody would kind of stand out to me, and so I have them stand up. So far, that's me. But it's me being led. Like I'm feeling like this is what God wants to do. So I'm, I'm getting that in prayer before the meeting. But the moment that they stand up, I don't have anything. I don't have a word for them. But once they stand up, then the Holy Spirit, something bubbles up. And I start with that. Once I start, it's kind of like bungee jumping. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. There's an element of faith. We prophesy in proportion to our faith. So there's that moment where you have them stand up, you don't have a word for them. They stand up and all of a sudden something starts bubbling. Once you start, once you say it, more comes through. And that's, that's how uh, often those who have a gift of prophecy, that's how it will work. So tonight uh, I'll, we'll, I'll be in a meeting where they'll bring some people who uh, they, the, the leaders of the church want me to pray over. They pre they've chosen these people beforehand. They've invited me beforehand for the express purpose of laying hands on them. Well, I don't feel particularly spiritual. I don't feel like I'm up and at I'm, I'm missing some meals. I'm trying to get my heart. I'm going to take some time to pray to try to get my heart in line with what God wants to do. But there's a sense of, of bungee jumping where you're actually trusting the, trusting the grace will be there the moment you lay hands on them. And that, that comes when there's a gift of prophecy. But it's a cooperation. That's what I want you to see in verse 21.